Equalizer 2 is the latest example of a 45 minute film that's been padded out to two hours. Kind of like a Marvel Netflix series. Denzel Washington is back as Robert McCall uh, in a movie that's based on the TV series from the 80s. And you know, Denzel's gonna Denzel. He, he's, a, he's an amazing actor, one of my favorite actors of all time. He's like the black version of Pacino or De Niro. They deliver the same thing each time, as good, great as it is. Denzel is now doing the same thing. He's not necessarily playing a character. He's playing Denzel. I mean, I, can, I think the last time Denzel actually played a character, maybe Malcolm X, possibly Training Day. Uh, I know the, his debut in Carbon Copy, he was actually playing a character. I submit that if you were to swap in any of the last few characters Denzel has played, whether the character in Two Guns with Marky Mark or Unstoppable with Chris Pine or Man on Fire, you put those, any of those three characters into this film, you wouldn't know the difference. But that's not a complaint. That's not a problem with the film. I think the problem with this film is that, unlike the first one, which kind of played on its, what, from what I remember of it, it kind of played on its hokiness and cheesy factor. I'm thinking mainly of the villain who was way over the top, which is what made that film so great and so entertaining because it embraced that cheesiness. You know, you have at the end of that, la of that last film, You've got, uh, they're in a Home Depot or something like that, and Denzel's in, in the rain or the water, and you know he's basically taking this guy out home alone style. Well, this movie decides to take itself a little bit more seriously than it really needs to, and that leads to uh, a very slow first and second act. This movie doesn't really kick into its plot maybe within the, 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 the second part of the second act. There's a scene that happens early on that we've all seen in the trailers. I think these trailers are just giving us way too much. But there's a scene that takes place with a lot of, uh, I guess, frat boy Gordon Gecko types in a hotel room. That's, it, it's, it's very visceral, gets the blood pumping, but it really has nothing to do with the, the central story. This is the point where usually I'd... Uh give you a chance to do the right thing, but not tonight. Tonight I'm gonna need your cameras, cell phones, anything you might have used to record what you did to her. You knocked on the wrong door tonight, Pops. At the very beginning of the film, there's a scene which takes place on a train traveling through Turkey. Again, great action sequence, nice fight choreography, has nothing to do with the film. And then there's some subplots. Well, there's one subplot which has absolutely nothing to do with the film. It, it does make for a nice resolution at the end, and it's a resolution that was personal to me, so it really kind of broke me down. But be that as it may, it had nothing to do with the film. Now contrast that subplot with another subplot involving a young black teenager, which it seems like that doesn't really go anywhere and there's, a, there's some time devoted to a scene where Denzel's character kind of gets him out of trouble. I don't want to spoil it, but that scene is kind of upended by what happens in the last act with this team where he's jeopardized because of Denzel's career, what Denzel does for a living. But the overarching point I'm trying to make is that a lot of, there are a lot of elements in this film that don't really uh, gel with the central plot, that have nothing to do with forwarding that central plot. And it really shows, like I said, the, the central plot kicks in like somewhere in the middle part of the second act. And it's not that hard to, do, to, to predict what's gonna happen. I mean, it was very much like The Incredibles where you can predict who, who's the overarching enemy uh, of the plot of the overarching antagonist pretty much right off the bat and you're you're sitting there wondering like okay I figured it out why are y'all dragging this out I mean come on let's just keep this moving the central plot does kind of shine a soft light onto uh, Robert McCall's background in this film it doesn't directly flash back to anything but we can intimate why uh, Robert McCall is who he is and how he's as skilled as he is and 
uh, what what some of the dynamics are from his past that are now present in this film. You do fly off to Brussels tomorrow. Thought you were retired. Oh, I am. Just like your dad. <laughs> okay. The problem is, is that if you've seen any Jason Bourne film, if you saw The Manchurian Candidate, ironically, well, either the original one or ironically, the one starring Denzel, which came out uh, some time ago, it's nothing more unique than that. It's very derivative of all those films. And not only that, but it kind of insults your intelligence by not even trying to expand on those other films and in in such a similar plot line. Whereas the first movie was kind of like all out action, kind of like a Charles Bronson death wish type of thing, which, which worked. This film wants to be more of like a, a quasi political thriller slash pot boiler. And it just doesn't have the weight to carry that. It's, so, it's, it's just so paper thin. Um, the characters, which are very two-dimensional, and the, the story itself, it's just, there's not much, there's not much heft to it at all. That's not to say the, like I said, the, the action scenes that are present are dope, uh, though a lot of them, some of them in the beginning have nothing to do with the, the film. There's one scene, a fight scene that takes place in the car, which was genuinely thrilling. I don't think, I'm, I'm sure I've seen it before, but here it was, I thought it was done very well. Probably the the best scene of the film involves the young teenager, which I mentioned before, uh, being trapped in Robert's house while some bad guys are coming to take Robert out. Uh, that, and I don't think I spoiled anything there, but um, that was probably the most gripping scene because the subplot involving that teen, while it, a lot of it doesn't have a lot to do with the plot, only tertiarily, uh, they do build up that teen sufficiently that we feel for him in that situation. So that was a great scene. The final scene takes place on uh, like a, a resort island or uh, like a Nantucket type of island in the middle of a hurricane. And it's very atmospheric, very well done. I'm, I'm curious to know how they shot it, if a lot of the rain and the storm and wind were wind machines and digital rain or whatnot. It was very effective, very moody. But ultimately, it's just very derivative, kind of tired, not even as interesting as the final scene in the first film. Although I did notice that, again, we've got Denzel uh, in the rain, in, in the water, in, in wetness, <laughs> kicking ass. I don't know if that was a shout out to the first film, but I noticed it. I really believe that if they had focused more on Robert McCall's relationship with the young teenager and uh, keeping him out of trouble and um, kind of steering him in the right direction, again, I don't want to give too much away, I think I would have been more entertained by that film than the derivative plot that we got here. So I'm just going to give this movie two and a half reels out of five. When it comes out on HBO or Netflix, I'd say definitely check it out. I don't know if I'd even recommend you buying it on DVD. It's worth the watch, but not going out to the theater, I would say no. Um, it's just too slow at parts, uh, a subplot that really has nothing to do but take up uh, valuable screen time, and a derivative Jason Bourne plot, which doesn't really kick in until the middle of the second act of this movie. But now let me ask you this question. I just want I'm, I'm just curious where you guys are with this. You got John Wick, you got Robert McCall, Denzel Washington's Robert McCall. You got Liam Neeson in Taken. You got Tom Cruise and Ethan Hunt. And you got Jason Bourne. You put all those guys in a cage. Who's walking out of that? I'm just curious. I just want to know. And speaking of Tom Cruise, all right, I'm ready. Bring on Mission Impossible Fallout. I want to see Henry Cavill's mustache that caused so much controversy in Justice League. And that's all I got to say, that's the martini.